This conference will now be recorded. Okay, thank you for all those who have attended so far. I'm sure we're going to have a couple uh, people uh, coming in over the next few minutes, but thank you for joining. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Coyote HD High Density Dome Closure. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Brendan O'Boyle from PLP. He has been with PLP for eight years, uh, coming up here uh, very shortly. Before that, he was with a manufacturer's rep where he was involved with uh, selling and uh, promoting PLP products. Currently, he is the Western Regional Sales Manager for the communications market with PLP and also is the chairperson for the Fiber Development Specialist Committee for the Fiber Broadband Association. So he can share a lot of knowledge, has a lot of knowledge of this product. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Brendan O'Boyle. Hey, thanks, Charlie. I appreciate that. I want to give a special thanks to you and Ashley and SNS Solutions for putting this together. Also, I want to thank everyone that was able to get on today. Uh, if you're like me, you probably have 12 other things that you could be doing. And chances are you're doing uh, eight of those things while I'm going through this, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I think it's just kind of the world that we're living in today. But thank you for going out of your way to spending time with uh, with me and, and SNS and going through the Coyote HD today. So, uh, hey, Charlie, I'm having an issue with my screen. I'm seeing, I think, Robin, I'm getting your your screen for some reason. Your black screen uh, is up on mine instead of me getting the, the uh, visual. So I don't know if that's something that maybe you could minimize or how that works. Do you guys see the presentation or do you see a black screen? Uh, there's no video with it, or there's just, it's on one scene here. Is it I black? It. No, it's the Coyote oh. HD dome closure. Hmm. Is it okay. the video started yet? It's a, it's, it's a presentation, but for some reason I'm getting a black screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I will start sharing again and see if that helps. Tell me if you see this. Hmm. I see it. Do you really? Okay. All right, for some reason I'm getting a black screen on this, Charlie. Let me see. Maybe I had a different box popped up. Okay, I'm seeing it now. All right, okay. sorry for that, guys. So we're gonna we're gonna jump into it here. So I'll tell you a little bit about PLP. Um, PLP has been around since 1947. Uh, it was started by a gentleman by the name of Thomas Peterson, and the company really started on the premise of formed wire, hence pre-formed. And basically, Thomas Peterson invented the technique to preformed wire into a helix shape and developed uh, a product that's now referred to as armor rod, which is basically a conductor repair uh, a splice application. We also have splicing applications for messenger applications uh, in the traditional telecom market. And, you know, we really developed that technology and, and have been you know, kind of uh, evolving that line over time. And now, you know, most people that are in line construction understand that the guy grip dead end is just one of those premier products. So that was where PLP started. And uh, now we've evolved into 2020 as being a provider of, you know, all manner of fiber optic connectivity solutions. Uh, yes, still that hardware to both the telephone and uh, power utility markets. But we've also gotten into drone inspection and some other uh, exciting avenues. Uh, but we started uh, way back in 1947, so we've been here for a little while. Headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, we manufacture this product in Rogers, Arkansas, and Albemarle, North Carolina. We have 21 global facilities, so a lot of folks think of PLP as as being just an American uh, company, where you know we like to boast that. The products that we sell here, we make here, but we also have a pretty strong international presence. Uh, that number of 3,000 employees is probably a little bit lower uh, than it is today, but uh, it's a good round one to tie it to. About 3,000 employees work at PLP. Uh, we do business in 140 countries, and you know that number in 2017 was 378. It's, a, it's climbing more and more every day based on the need for fiber, the need for you know solutions 
like ADSS and yes, that traditional uh, uh, hardware solution that I talked about in regards to the guy grip dead end, but also this Coyote HD. And it's because the more fiber backhaul is required to power future technologies like 5G and you know, fiber is the most reliable connection that you can get, period. Uh, there's still room in the marketplace for wireless and things of that nature. Uh, there's just some spots that you just can't get to, uh, but generally fiber is where it's at. We have a research and testing laboratory in Cleveland. Uh, I'd like to point this out just to let uh, everyone know that what we make, we test on a daily basis. Uh, you know, we take random samples from our manufacturing facilities, we bring them to our Cleveland headquarters, and we test all of that stuff. So we make sure that it's good and reliable by the time it gets into your hands. As it applies to the Coyote HD, we have a uh, fiber optic closure uh, testing area. There's actually a couple places where that takes place, but generally it's off to the side here where you can't see. But we perform a modified and summarized version of the Telcordia GR771 core test that encompasses waterhead testing. You know, these closures have to be rated to be able to be put under 20 foot of waterhead. We also perform freeze thaw and temperature cycling tests to, to freeze the closures and then bring them back out of thaw and, and overheat them and then bring them back into freezing and over and over and over again to make sure that they can withstand the temperatures in North Dakota and also you know Phoenix, Arizona alike, or should I say Mesa, shout out to SNS Solutions there. But we make sure that our, our products are built to last. So we have a few uh, notable brands uh, in the marketplace. So I'll just spell out that, you know, Coyote is what the HD is tied to. Guy Grip Dead End I had brought up. Armadillos are copper stuff. We still play heavily in copper. We're one of the last standing companies that play in this space actually. Uh, and Fiberline is our ADSS portfolio. And then we have many other, you know, trademarks and registered trademarks that fall under those brands, but that's how Preform looks at itself and that's how we segment out who we work with. You know, again, Armadillo Stainless, Guy Grip Dead Ends, Fiberline, all manner of ADSS hardware, and then the Coyote Fiber Optics, which is what we're here to talk about today, specifically the Coyote HD closure. So I'm going to kind of start from the beginning in regards to the closure for those of you that may not be initiated or, or work with the product or, or understand it to this level. But the reason why the Coyote HD is one of the fasting, fastest growing products that PLP is moving today is that it's structured around this patented segmented end plate system. So this has been on the market for some time now, but we still, we still hold the patent for having an end plate and a fiber optic splice closure that gets used in an outside plant or inside plant environment for that nature, that each port can be accessed individually to access the individual cables. Uh, you know, that's our, our technology and, and uh, we own the rights to that today. And because of that, if you really apply that to what the Coyote HD does, which is really manages high count ribbon cables for the most part, though some people do use single fusion for that, uh, you know, you'll have a 28 feeder cable, for instance, but then you're going to break that down. Some folks are breaking it down into 864s. So maybe you'll have, you know, uh, an 864, you know, mid sheath coming into this, that'll eat up two of your ports. And then you'll have a couple of 864s coming out and that'll be another two. And then you have three ports for spare for later on, just in case you had to tap something else into that. But some people are breaking it down into 432s. And so you'll take your 1728 and you'll actually break that down into four, 30, two, uh, four 432s. So therefore you've got six ports eaten up, but you still have that seventh for spare. But what's really cool about this uh, end plate system is that if you had some unfortunate damage on one of those ports and, and one of those cables got cut for some reason, maybe it wasn't located correctly, and uh, you know a contractor uh, you know is just following the lines perhaps or maybe you know something went awry and something got cut out there if you had to go in and repair it you don't have to open up the whole end plate to get to that individual port you're only getting to one port to make that repair similarly if you're adding something like a like a flat cable for let's just say it's an MST tail or something like that and you know you're only adding one little cable into the end plate 
Again, the segmented end plate allows you to enter that one little cable in without disrupting the rest of what you have going on in here. I mean, you could have up to 3,456 lit fibers in here and you wanna get in here and add you know, a single fiber. You don't wanna bring things down just for that. So the segmented end plate is great for that as well. There's an air valve for flash testing, which we strongly recommend. And then you have uh, stu ground studs that allow you to isolate armored cables for locating purposes. So you have seven individual studs on these seven individual ports, okay? So that's the end plate of this system. So you would restrain your grommet to your end plate with an L bracket. You know, when you have this hose clamp attached to your L bracket on your cable, you'd be able to attach it to your ground stud. That allows you to be able to connect your ground wire to the outside of the end plate and take it to your grounding terminal outside. And this is really how the system thrives from a bonding and grounding perspective. You can prepare this closure by putting all of this hardware on outside of the closure. You don't need to put it on inside of the closure. Uh, so, you know, you can do it, you know, uh, ahead of time and make sure that you have plenty of working room to go through. The entire system works on a silicone grommet system. So if you're not familiar with preformed or you're just not familiar with this system or, or how it really operates, you know, if you were a, a, someone that maybe preferred another manufacturer and you're looking at the way we do it, you might look at this and say, wow, you got a lot of grommets, fella. You know, I'm not quite sure I want to have to work with all of those. Well, the great news is, is you really don't have to do that. Uh, what you see here are different solutions. And I say that by stating that, you know, if you looked at, you know, this single hole grommet, it's a dot four to dot six hole. And that usually encompasses cables from a loose tube standpoint, it'll encompass typically 24s, sometimes up to 144s, but you're pretty well guaranteed it's gonna cover 96s in that. And then, you know, when you step up, you've got this one hole six to eight five, that's usually your 144 to your 288, capturing your 216 in there. And then your 85 to 10 is usually your 288 up to your 1728s, believe it or not, all get captured in that specific range. Okay. So, but if again, if you looked at this dot four to dot six single hole grommet here, you'll also see that there's a two hole grommet down here, dot four two to dot six. And you know, you would say to yourself, okay, what's the difference here? And the difference would be that you know, PLP had to compromise two uh hundredths of a of an inch here to be able to get two holes into that grommet. But what we can do now is we can put multiple cables per port into that end plate, you know, just in case you needed that real estate to be successful in your network moving forward. So it, we do see people putting, you know, multiple larger cables into ports, but really where the success comes from is these smaller holes. And the reason for that is, is that these smaller holes can handle, yes, small round cables that fit into that diameter, but they can also handle a flat drop profile. And so that flat drop profile is this, you know, consistent with MST tails. It's also consistent with typical flat drop. There's just really so much you can do with this grommet uh, up to and including number six jacketed waterproof ground wire can go through that hole as well. So that's really a multi-purpose type grommet for this system. So really this segmented end plate, yes, you do need a grommet for each port. However, whatever situation you run into, whether it's a small pushable drop cable from like a PPC or Clearfield, or whether it's an RPX profile cable from Corning or what have you, preform line products can mold a grommet that can help you solve problems in the field for these growing networks. And we do it all the time, every day. So that's the way the grommet system works. When you looked at the diameters covered, I kind of went over this a little bit, but if you looked at it, you would see that three grommets can really cover an entire range of cables going down to a 12 fiber. And really, I've seen single drop cables that actually fit in this uh, 800-3692 grommet. You know, it's kind of crazy, but up in the, the upper Midwest, you'll find that there are drop cables on the market that are a dot six seven in diameter. And so, you know, again, with the seven ports of entry, we can handle a significant amount of that drop out of uh, a seven port case, like that end plate I showed you earlier. But just know that 
just because you need a grommet to cover you know a range of cables we can actually cover a pretty broad range just with one grommet all right as it applies to hd closures typically you're going to be seeing 1728 splicing in there or 864 splicing in there so this is a true sampling of outside plant cables and their their uh, outside diameters and then the fiber count associated with it and what you can see is that if you were going to take a 1728 and break it out to two 864s you're doing that in one grommet size if you're going to do a 1728 and break it out into 432s yes if it was dielectric you would get into a second size but feasibly if someone had the armored version of it again with these cable manufacturers and they they vary slightly and so it could be that you know the dielectric does fit into this grommet for a certain manufacturer but generally you can see with this hd there's not a lot of variable that you have to be concerned with and that's important to to note with this when you look at the Coyote HD kit, you look at different organizer uh, configurations, okay? So we have the end plate. This is that seven port end plate that I showed you earlier with all the ports that explode out of it there. They're all restrained by two bolts, two gold bolts. But when you look at the actual organizers themselves, you'll see that you have some options here. And why do we have these options? Well, you have versions that have no basket, Okay, there's no slack basket inside of this organizer. You would just take the trays themselves and you would mount them directly to the organizer bar, which is heresy when you talk about how ribbon fiber splicing has traditionally been done, okay? So we're actually proposing a new way to think about ribbon splicing. You have a second option, which is a shallow basket. For the amount of ribbon that we're talking about or the amount of fiber we're talking about going into these cases typically this isn't going to be enough to store the slack loop that you would you would typically put into a closure uh, when we think about it traditionally you know traditionally your high count would have been 864 and you wouldn't have been able to fit it in a basket of this size so why do we have it this basket is there just so you can open up core tube cables basically for the most part and you can redistribute the fiber from that unitube construction into multiple furcation tubes to be able to guide them onto the trays, okay? So all this does, all this, this shallow basket does down here is direct traffic for your ribbon to go from the outside world to your splice tray. That's what it does. I'm gonna show you an alternative to that that I think you'll like. If you have customers that are getting into it, I can tell you, Everyone that we've dealt with that's dealing with this amount of fiber or dealing with ribbon in general, specifically core tube ribbon, they love what I'm going to show you today uh, in regards to a product called a breakout kit. The third option would be this deep basket version. This is about as traditional as you get. This deep basket can house 864s all day long. Uh, it, it will do every job that you think a ribbon closure should do if you think about it very traditionally. With this basket and this tray scheme here, you could store and splice in 864, you know, 864 fibers, okay? And the laterals that go in to support that. This has all the storage you need for that particular job. Again, we're proposing another way to look at this and we'll get into that, but this is the traditional version of a ribbon splice closure. You can also see that you have uh, different tray depth. So you have a deep tray, and then you also have a shallow tray, and we're gonna talk about that. But when you look at the deep tray and the shallow tray, they're both 288 splices. So I've got three deep trays on this organizer, that'll get me to 864, okay? I've got six shallow trays on here, that'll give me to 1728, okay? So why do I have deep versions and shallow versions? Why wouldn't I just use the shallow? We'll talk about that. So, when you look at these trays, you have a splicing area and you have a storage area. And so applying the concepts that I talked about, about wanting to push towards a non-basket type closure for ribbon storage, you would look at the deep tray. If you were using a flat ribbon, you would require a generous area to store flat ribbon in. And we're gonna take a look at wired pictures at the end so I can kind of tie these uh, uh, concepts together for those that aren't really dealing with it to this intimate of a level but you'd need to have a lot of area to store that flat ribbon and then of course you have to splice it 
So uh, these yellow blocks are all our ribbon splice blocks. These orange ones are our single fusion blocks. So for the ribbon blocks, this one area with these three yellow blocks is 144 splices. This happens to sit on top of another position that has 144 splices. That gets us to our 288 splice count, ribbon splice count per tray. For this ribbon tray, instead of having that second block position on top of the first block position, we actually push it down the tray because this is the shallow version. This tray is exactly one half the depth of this tray. So for every deep tray, you can fit two shallow trays, all right? And so for this second position, you have 144 here. So this is also a 288 tray, but it's half the depth. Now, as I said, if you're using flat ribbon, traditional flat ribbon, you're gonna want to have a generous amount of storage area. But if you're using a um, kind of a rollable ribbon technology uh, cable, flex ribbon, or some of there's many flavors of this on the marketplace, but realistically, that that type of ribbon that you can peel apart and then compresses very nicely, you can get that to roll into this smaller storage area. The width is absolutely great as far as the bend diameter. There's no concerns there. It's just a matter of how much that ribbon can compress, and in this shallow tray, it can compress pretty well, uh, and you can actually splice and store, you know, 288 splices on this tray so that's why you would pick a deep tray versus a shallow tray is it flat ribbon because if it's flat ribbon you're splicing you're going to need the deep tray you don't really have the choice you could technically bring your flat ribbon onto the tray and maybe home run it onto the block but there's really not any area for storage because if you're routing flat ribbon onto a tray you're going to have an area where it crosses over itself and that crossover is a certain height. You know, you got one ribbon riding on top of another one, and that's going to push up into the, where the lid area is on this tray. That's why we need to have a deep tray for that. So flat ribbon tray, rollable ribbon tray, or collapsible ribbon tray. And then, like I said, we do support single fusion. We had a pretty notable, I'd say, I guess, tier two size customer, uh, mainly transport is their business model, but they wanted to splice and store 864 loose tube fibers. And I can reliably tell you that in our Coyote HD that comes with a buffer tube organizer, they were able to splice 864 fibers and they were able to store the buffer tube for those 864 fiber cables in a Coyote HD. And they did it utilizing this last tray, this 108 count tray. This gave them another splicing position on the tray. So instead of having a 72 count tray, they had a 108 count tray. But for you know notable tier one customers that are dealing in high count ribbons, a lot of these folks are breaking ribbons and they're splicing them into singles. So that means they'll take a ribbon that has 12 fibers in it and they want you know fiber number three out of that. They want the green fiber out of that flat out of that flat ribbon. And so what they have to do is they have to split that ribbon up and they're just going to splice one single fiber to that. So these blocks are actually interchangeable. So you could have all ribbon splicing on a tray, and then if they wanted to have an individual single splicing position, you would have, you'd have to have a spot on the tray to hold the block for it. Again, this nine position tray gives us the ability to have more block positions. So if it's rollable ribbon, no problem. If it's flat ribbon, you might have to do some tray jumping or some other exotic things to, to make that work. Uh, but that's going on out there today. Looking at the width of these and the height of these trays, you know, six and 6.1 inches wide. For those of you out there that may be used to our traditional coyote stuff, um, you know, the trays that are in the smaller closures, the the width on that is six and a quarter inches. So if you've ever held a coyote splice tray uh, from the the newer system that has the grommets and all that stuff, it's six and a quarter inches wide. So it's about that wide, and then it's significantly taller than our traditional system. But that's to give you the generous storage area that we had talked about. And this is it. I mean, th this picture really shows you the big difference between the shallow tray and the deep tray, and the amount of additional uh, storage real estate that you get. And we use every ounce of that for flat ribbon. And I'll show you that here in a minute. You know, like I said before, you have a block position that sits on top of another splicing position. That's how we get to that 288. 
And again, here's that another look at that uh, single fusion tray, or it could also be your ribbon tray, but this is that that uh, shallow version of that tray, splicing position, I'm sorry, storage position and splicing positions. You know, how many trays can you fit? It really has to do with that organizer. So if you had no basket whatsoever, you could put six deep trays, okay? So without a, when you say without transition tray, that's the basket. You could put six deep trays, get you to 1728. If you didn't have a basket and you use these thin trays for the rollable ribbon, you can get to 3456. If you had a uh, single fusion, 12 of these trays can get you to 864, okay? And so if you add a basket into it, these numbers reflect the shallow basket, not the deep one. So with the shallow basket, you could get four of the deep trays getting you to 1152. With the shallow basket, you could get eight of the narrow trays and get you to 1728. And if you had the narrow basket, you could get eight of these single fusion trays getting you to 576 if you're wild enough to try and pull that off over a couple of weekends. So looking again at these organizers from the side, you have um, no basket in this. You have the deep splice tray. So this is that 1728 configuration. This is that shallow basket we've been talking about. That's going to be 1152 with four deep trays. And then with that deep basket, you're going to get to 864 with three of these deep trays. You know, this basket can kind of help you out because it gives you the ability to, like I said, open up core tube cables. So most high density cables have some way to transport the ribbon to the tray, some some buffer tube or ribbon and loose tube configuration that they would be able to transport the fiber. When you open up the jacket back around this area here towards the end plate, you'd be able to send your buffer tubes up the side and into the tray. But it could be that if you have a very congested closure and you need additional areas to open up core tube cables, you know, you may want to consider a basket um, I think if you have that many cables coming in and you're marrying to a 1728, you're probably going to be more concerned with splice capacity than you are with your ability to open in a basket. So it, it kind of forces you into a position to say, how do I get this job done? I have a 1728 and I'm trying to break it into, you know, umpteen cables. What's the best way to do that? We'll talk about that here in a, in a minute. So this is what it would look like with that, that, you know, ribbon and loose tube configuration where you'd have your your outside plant rated cable terminated to your L bracket. You'd have your your loose tubes uh, going up the side of that uh, organizer because that Coyote HD has a side storage compartment that our competitors don't, and it actually makes a huge difference. Most people will have you come into the closure and go right down into the base of it, whereas with the HD we have a routing position that's in line with the trays and that allows you to guide ribbon to these trays without having to have the basket. So now the elimination of the basket is because of a design choice and the organizer and you can take advantage of that and you should and many people are. And this is what it's looking like when you have that loose tube uh, ribbon cable coming out. The reason that we have these spiral tubes on it is because of just that that bend radius. And so you have to be conscious. And one of the things that you need to talk to your cable manufacturer about is, can I take your tubes and can I bend them around to route them into a splice tray? Or do I need to open those tubes? And the real issue there is, is all climate driven. So the bend radius is fine because I can I can make the bend with the fiber from here to there. So the issue is the tube itself and the rigidity of that tube. And is it going to be in a cold environment or is it going to be in a warm environment? If it's going to be in a cold environment, it's going to constrict and then it's going to attenuate your fiber. It'll certainly whiten the tubes. And when I say whiten, that means that it'll be bent it might look fine upon initial installation, but whenever it gets really cold and that plastic wants to contract and pull into itself, it may actually kink 
You may not have a measurable effect on the fiber, but you may, and so that's a risk that you have to be aware of. So generally on cables that have that tighter constitution of buffer tube, we retube them. And that's why you see these things pictured this way. It's not true of everybody. And I think the industry as a whole is, is getting more conscious of this. So uh, the OEMs are making um, conscious decisions to change that out. So in the Coyote system, one of the hallmarks of Coyote, this is just how we've done it forever, is yes, we do have this tray stack. That's not really consistent with how Coyote's typically done that. That's really more like our competitors have done it, but it really helps with the routing. And so that's why it exists this way in the closure. But what is true of Coyote and the way we still do business is that we have these trays be able to, to unclip from the organizer and be able to flip out and rest on a table. And that's not typical of all products because other products on the market have their trays oriented the other way. So the splicing position would actually be at the top end of this tray uh, or at the top end of where this stack is. Therefore, your, your fiber as it routes into it would come in on the end plate side. We don't like that because it's a lot of congestion right where your cables are entering the closure, we think that it's actually better to have your fiber get away from the end plate and route up onto the tray. And with this extra length that you've given yourself, this gives you the ability to unfold the tray, lay it out on the table. And when it comes to a 1728, God forbid one of those things gets cut, it's gonna happen, or maybe it has, maybe someone on this call is aware of one. I, I actually haven't heard of one where one's actually been cut and they've had to repair it. But the fact of the matter is, you're gonna wanna have the ability to have these trays laid out and you got two, three, four people getting that up and running because you've got 911 circuits on that. You've got probably some, some black ops circuits from the government I'm not even aware of running through that thing. You've gotta get that cable back up and running because your network is down. So you want to be able to be as flexible as possible to be able to splice this thing back into service. Okay. And just one thing I'll bring up about that, other than being able to flip that tray, is when you look at that end plate, because it's segmented, you could actually splice your fiber first, and then you can build your case backwards because you can always enter in your cable after the fact. There's nothing that keeps you, there's no device on this closure, or there's no aspect of this closure that requires you to apply it first, okay? You can splice first if you want, as long as you have your opening lengths, of course, but you can splice first and build backwards. The network's the priority, okay? So it would be a heck of a thing to get everything ready, and then you realize you didn't put something on first that you had to do, and then you gotta redo the whole thing. That's just not the case with the Coyote line. Since it's segmented, you can do it in another way. So I've talked a lot about, you know, no basket, and we like to look at it another way. And this is why we do that. We actually look at the Coyote Breakout Kit as a way for us to redistribute fiber throughout a closure system, okay? So this Coyote Breakout Kit is a clamshell design, and it actually fits around an 864 core tube cable. It's designed to do that. And so if you have an 864 cable with a core tube, and you need to get, you know, 216 fibers, we'll just say, out of that tube, and you need to send it to one of your trays, and then you're gonna send those other fibers to different trays, or maybe you're doing an express loop with the rest, that's possible. You're gonna have to be able to redistribute these ribbons. Now, traditionally, you would have used that really big black basket that I showed, and then you would have given up a lot of splicing capacity all right, because if you use that deep black basket, you've only got the real estate left to do 864 splices with flat ribbon. OK, and, you know, when I say that anything that comes in a core tube today, to my knowledge, is flat ribbon. Uh, I know that there's a manufacturer out there that doesn't use a tube in their rollable ribbon cable. So that's a, just a different thing altogether. But when you get down to it, this. Uh, breakout kit will allow you to redistribute fibers throughout your closure easily without having a basket, okay? This is an upgrade. When you take a look at some of the solutions that we build around high density closures, we look at the breakout kit and we also look at some of the accessories that we've put in place to make everyone's lives a lot easier and to make management of the fiber a lot more cohesive and a lot easier to re-enter and understand what's what. You know, this looks great, 
the and when I say this, I mean the colors, and that's really driven out of obviously the the fiber color code. But when you look at the tubes being colored from the manufacturers, that's a big plus. And then when you look at the expandable sleeving and slit sleeving that Preformed has, we have it colored to match those tubes. So this allows you to really nicely index what's going on in your closure. What this would have looked like before would have been a bunch of clear tubes probably uh, attached to those uh, ribbon and loose tube cables. And then they would mark them and it's not, it, it, it works, it's absolutely fine. People use colored tie wraps. You could use colored Sharpies, you could use colored tape, maybe you just make a note of it uh, and indicate that out of the orange tube, these customers are fed and, and that's great. But when you open up one of these closures and you look at it and you actually have to be the one that deals with it, having colored tubing that goes to each tray that it's supposed to go to makes it so easy to say, okay, it's coming out of my blue tube, I know exactly where that's going and I can tell exactly what it's mated with coming out of these core tube cables time 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 and time is money so these breakout kits actually will save you money and make you money in the long run by looking at this approach to it as opposed to the basket approach to it you can still use these colored tubes with a basket but again these breakout kits streamline it and make it easy for you to splice the maximum capacity that this closure can handle i do have a video here i wouldn't be so daring as to click into it but generally what i want to say is that on youtube preform line products has fiber tips and tricks videos and part of these fiber tips and tricks videos we have um, a great segment about this colored tubing the solid tubing uh, we also have a great segment about split tubing and how to put ribbon into a split tube as opposed to using spiral tubing uh, there's a lot of technicians out there that hate spiral tube they don't trust it they'll get uh, fibers caught in it the fibers will break so we actually have a better solution than that now. We have a kind of a fabric split tube that uses a small tool, a wire loom insertion, insertion tool. And you can actually lay your ribbon in it and then you turn this orange part over. It's a barrel that spins and you can make those flat ribbons captive. And then you use this shark fin right here to part the split in the tube and you pull that flat ribbon back through it. And it goes in like butter. I mean, it is absolutely awesome. So I would recommend you look at our fiber tips and tricks videos, look into our colored tubing, split and solid, and uh, and you'll see kind of what Preform's up to today in that space. This is what it looks like laid out with an express ring. So, you know, one of the questions we get often is, yeah, I have the 1728, but I'm only splicing 864 out of it. So what am I supposed to do with the rest of the fiber? Where's it go? I mean, you told me not to use a basket. Thanks for that. So now what am I supposed to do with it? Well, this is one of the things that you can do with it. You know, you can add uh, an, a uh, separate tube to it and you can route it around that closure. And by the way, it's it's color coded and it's gonna be really easy to see what's what and where it's going. Should you ever have to come back in and you're actually gonna tap back into that cable and add another lateral, you'll be able to find exactly what fiber you're looking for, okay? So just keep that in mind. We have other solutions that allow you to restrain strength members and closures. This is one approach to it. You'll have a little uh, bobbin, if you will, that will push back on the strength members. We have some pretty strong, big, thick, strong strength members that come in uh, a lot of these cables now. So there's different ways to look at it. We have bobbins to restrain that. We also have other devices that attach to the L bracket that uh, have a barrel head that you would send that strength member into and terminate it to that. So if you need that positive stop uh, that way, because there will be a little bit of pistoning that's involved in this process here. We think that by taping it, that is more captive, but you know, again, this is all preference stuff. These pins uh, actually fit into the trays, into the organizer assembly for the Coyote HD. So once you have all your trays loaded in, this pin comes with it, comes with a kit. You would just cut that pin to length and you would have to cut it if you had a basket you know so that basket's going to take up a certain amount of real estate therefore you'll cut this pin to the appropriate size and you'll put it down in the stack and that just manages it and keeps it from from kind of uh jumping around and jostling around which it really won't once it's deployed it should sit in place but if it's aerial you know and some people are putting these in the air uh, you're going to want to make sure that your trays are restrained 
to the best ability that you can. You use this pin for that. You also use a Velcro strap for that that comes with the closure. This is a little bit about the just the real quick how it preps and lays out. You know, this is buffer tube cable, but this is just a good way to show you this thing, this this type of closure in action. So you'd have your cables, and this was actually a rework from another closure getting put into a, a large coyote closure. And basically, you know, they removed all of the old hardware that was on these cables. They got them out of that old closure. And then basically they attached the new hardware for the coyote. They got their grommets. Yes, you can slit them. And there is a technique to it. You can make a number six out of it, as you see here. You know, we recommend that you don't make a 90 degree cut. Okay, so it looks like a lowercase i. You don't want that, you want a number six. And so you can slit them, put them on existing cables, dump them into the end plate. You can see you have your L brackets restrained to your cable here. That was done prior to entering them into the case. And then you put a little nut here and then you attach that uh, into the closure itself, okay? And then, you know, basically after you have all your cables entered, then you're gonna start playing with your buffer tubes and routing that stuff around. You're gonna tighten all the caps of your end plate, make sure all that stuff's good and tight and retight. You know, double check that. You're putting this underwater. Let's make sure that everything is together correctly and assembled correctly. We're asking it to do a lot. We have to do our part in order to make it do what it's supposed to do. That's true of every manufacturer's closure. You know, I'm not here to help anyone else out, but generally when someone says that guy's case leaks or that guy's case leaks, we can agree that it can be harder or easier to do a job. That's a fact. But generally, if you're talking about a respectable closure manufacturer, all of us made closures that seal. That's just the way it works. Um, and so it's just about the technique, okay? In this particular loose tube closure, we'd have our loose tube cables coming into it. We would route our loop of slack. And fortunately, the closure that this was coming out of dressed really nicely into this one. You can see that this loop just, it's, it's like perfect in here. So that worked out really great. And then they buttoned it up. So right now I'm gonna show you just some pictures of the HD deployed. I'll kind of rip through these. Uh, you know, and these are just for instances of what we kind of see with this HD stuff. So like I said, the number of cables that go into the end plate, this can vary. They vary in shape and size. This uh, assembly here happened before we had the breakout kit. So one of the reasons that we made the breakout kit was this particular project where someone said, hey, wait, I have these core tube cables and I have to get them redistributed. I don't have the room to have a basket in it because it's flat ribbon cable. So I can't have a basket. I'm going to have all the trays. How do I split all these things up? And we said, well, unfortunately, Mr. Customer, you're going to have to tape that joint, which is what they did right here. They taped the core tube cable. They slid back these uh, furcation tubes and they taped them off. And then they redistributed these tubes to the trays. This is in the early days of high density fiber deployment. And so we said, we're sorry, we know you don't love that, we promise we'll fix it. And we sure, we sure as well did. So this is that without a breakout kit. They chose to heat shrink the tubes uh, to the ribbon and loose tube configuration here at this particular uh, spot. This is belt and suspenders, you can tape it. You know, they just wanted to be extra cautious, once again, early days. But look at the amount of fiber we're talking about here, it's absolutely crazy. Um, you know, and this is them getting ready to prep the, the flat ribbon onto that deep tray. This is why it's got to be deep. I mean, this stuff is just so robust. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something you can really mush down. So you need to have that deep tray. This is it stored onto that tray in this particular area. So you can see how flat ribbon fills it up. This is the deep tray. This is exactly why you can't have a thin tray for this. Look at how much room that that eats up. It's it's basically getting right up to the to the storage years there, which is what it's designed to do, but it fills that area up. Can you imagine if that circle was half as tall? Absolutely not. And also half as deep? No way. But with collapsible ribbon, you can make it happen. Okay. This is just, <laughs> this is what can happen. You know, high density fiber. It's this job isn't for everybody. I'll be honest, this job's not for me. I can talk about it all day long, but I have mad respect for people that get out here and make these closures look like a million bucks. They make my job easy. But guys like this are out there. And this is this closure, you know, kind of dressed out and finished up with clear tubing. Like I said, again, with the categorization, you can put colored tie wraps on here. You can write whatever you want on these tubes. 
but it's just going to make your life harder when you're going back trying to trace a tube back to where it needs to be. If this was colored and you said, yeah, the fiber you're looking for is coming out of blue, tell me how quickly you can find that. You don't even have to squint for that. Looking at some stuff we did in Atlanta, you know, this is one cable manufacturer's cable, um, but it's, you know, we're kind of figuring it out for the first time. You know, basically this is them and, and their tubes are routing directly to the tray. Uh, this is a flat ribbon cable as well. So we have our deep tray here. All right, and they did pretty good with this. You know, this is, I'm not mad at this. You know, there's some guys that would get this this loop nice and tight. They actually, you know, we recommend to have the storage loop in the storage area, but they looped around the outside. They made it happen. It was one of the first ones they'd ever done. So they were able to, you know, move some things, make some concessions and make it happen. Uh, yeah, so this is those tubes all routed, you know, this, this particular tubing, you can route directly to the tray. Um, so that helps with the color coding. So we don't have to use additional tubing for that. If you had a core tube cable though, and you were marrying it to this, so this is just a 1728 butt splice, but if you were marrying a smaller count cable to this and you wanted to break out a core tube, you know, we would recommend colored tubing. You can use whatever you want. And in fact, the breakout kit doesn't come with colored tubing. It actually comes with kind of a slick opaque tubing that is, it's it's clear. There's no color to it. Um, but, uh, you know, generally we recommend that you color match if you possibly can. But this is what this looks like all, all dressed up. And that's the closure itself buttoned up. Easy peasy, 1728 butt splice, no laterals, no fuss, no muss, nothing else to be concerned with. That's an easy day, you know, anymore. We were all pretty scared the first time we were doing this, but when we figured out a butt splice is a butt splice, the only difference between here and there was the time. So this was actually not bad. Georgia State was the first place we used the breakout kit. And we were so pumped when we saw this thing dressed out. So this is the tubing that it comes with. And I mean, compared to that taped joint, this is just a thousand times better. Uh, it just looks better. It's going to be longer lasting because if things start to piston and move, we actually have mechanical restraint with this breakout kit to this cable. Um, you know, you can break out these sets really nicely, send them to the trays that they need to go. Um, this particular cable is one is the one I was talking about that didn't have a core tube. It's just it's collapsible ribbon, but there's no tubing. So you have to find a way to make that work. And so this is what that would look like. We have ways to redistribute cables that don't have tubes in them. And that's what this breakout kit. So it's very flexible. And this is the space that it takes up. You know, I showed you some pictures earlier where it was actually a computer made them, but this is the real world. This is below the black clips. So the black clip is the halfway point of this D bracket, I'll call it. But this breakout kit sits below that. So you could put a couple of these on each side if they were this full, right? You could also stagger them. So you could have, you know, one of them back here and then put another one up here and probably a third, you know, based on how you spaced them, you could actually pull this one back into the storage bracket uh, one midway and then one um, further up into, you know, the closure and then put that in the, in the bracket as well. And you'd still have room to make your transition. So you have ways of fitting things. We try not to cram 10 pounds of stuff in the sack, but if you had to, you, you have room to work with. This is this closure finished. You know, you've got that breakout kit in here. Okay. I'm going to button that up. California, Robin Maine, what's up? You've got this, um, you know, this right here is taking a look at some uh, strength member restraint that we have. And, you know, nothing special here. Again, this is another ribbon and loose tube construction, slightly smaller tubes for that. You know, this is one where they're having a ribbon and loose tube. They're also using clear transport tube. So they slit this tube, which is why they had to heal it with this other tape, okay? Uh, if they didn't have you know, our split tubing. This is something that you might have to do. If you didn't like spiral tubing, this is something you'd have to do, but we have better solutions than that now. Uh, this is a collapsible ribbon product on a thin tray. Okay, so you can kind of see the space that you get back. You can just splice and store a lot more in this system. And here you go, that's that that collapsible ribbon. Yeah, you could store it down in this area, that's what we recommend, but they opted to go around the outside of the tray and, and they have the room for that. They're gonna have to get back into the fiber they wanna get to, and that's gonna take a minute, but generally you have the room to do this.
Okay, and that's that closure finished up and dressed out. Denver, this is kind of showing you a ribbon uh, configuration that also has singles spliced into it. So this is what this would look like on this nine position tray. This is the low profile nine position tray, collapsible ribbon. I can break one of my ribbons and I can splice singles out of it. Okay. And then to this one, Temple, it's really more about the place. If you've been to Temple, Texas, you ought to be surprised there's a 1728 there. Uh, but there is. I mean, it's growing like a weed out there. And, and so this can go anywhere. Whenever someone tells me not in my backyard, I just laugh. And I ask them if they've been to Temple, Texas before. So this is the, you know, flat ribbon cable. They're dressing that thing out, ready to go. They got it all buttoned up. And that's that. So that's all I have today. We went through ribbon and loose tube. We went through core tube cables. We talked about how to route them, how to dress them, the various aspects of the Coyote HD. I sure hope that you guys got some value out of this presentation. You know, I talk about it all the time. I, I'm so, I love this job. I could do this eight days a week, but I just want to make sure that the content you get is what you want. So if you didn't hear what you needed to hear today, please tell us and solutions that I will work with you personally and get you what you need. But generally, you know, thank you for your time truly. And thank you SNS solutions for the platform. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you, Brendan. Does uh, anybody have any questions for Brendan at this point regarding the HD or something else that you saw? You can go ahead and unmute. Will it be possible to get a copy of the presentation, Brendan? Yeah, I think we could do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's Chris there. Yeah, we can get something out to you. I would, I would love to do that. I'll get that to you uh, ASAP. Thank you. Great presentation. Yep. Hey, Brendan, Thank this you, is sir. Chad. If, you're, if you want to send it to me, I'll get it to my team. Perfect. All right, Chad, you got it. Thank you for that. Yep. Well, if nobody has any other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, dismiss. But thank you all for coming. Thank you, Brendan, for the great presentation. And we will send out uh, this presentation recorded along with a a uh, sales sheet for the uh, HD dome. And if there's any questions, please do not hesitate in reaching out to us. Thank you and have a wonderful day.